Let's go, girls. From New York City to Los Angeles, Powered Up with Beck and Franklin is giving women of all ages permission to live the life they've always dreamed of. Why live in black and white when you can choose the brilliance of 3D and Technicolor? Each week, Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin and their high-powered guests will be here to cheer you on, to share their challenges, their successes, and what they've learned along the way. It's all about women supporting women. The stories and practical tips on sex, beauty, money, and so much more are designed to help you reconnect to the powerful woman you are. Fabulous knows no limits. Now it's time for you to expand your boundaries. Here are Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Barry Eaton, and the book of the hour is The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife, and we're going to be visiting today with author Barry Eaton, who is our psychic reporter. He explores the known and the unknown, and Barry, I got to tell you, we talk about a lot of things on our shows together. We go from everything from, you know, the present life, the afterlife. We're going to talk about cancer. We're going to talk about all the different tools that you use to help you in your recovery beyond traditional medicine. This is not designed to take the place of traditional medicine. This is designed to give people an opportunity to have their concepts open to other things that can help in the process. Now, when my mom was sick, we used Reiki, we used acupuncture, we used um, meditation and all sorts of things. And Barry, even when I was sick, you know, back when I was 13, like, you know, like 30 years ago, I had a tumor on my thyroid and the doctor from the Mayo Clinic had me do these meditations where I memorized spaceships and I gave them all names and they were supposed to go and zap the tumor and I had to sit there, you know, for 15 minutes a day in my little hospital bed, imagining these spaceships attacking the tumor. And it didn't dawn on me till many, many years later that he was using my own mind-body connection in my healing process. And, you know, the idea that it would be foreign today to implement some of these tools in our healing process to me seems automatic, but it's not automatic for everyone. So that's why I'm excited to have you talk about uh, your experience and what you did to um, enhance your relationship with spirit, but also, you know, what you used on a regular basis that that you felt made a difference. Great. Yeah, well, thank you, Sandra. Good to talk to you again, too. Uh, Look, years and years ago, I worked with a wonderful healer, and she was helping somebody with cancer, a young girl, and uh, her name was Jo Buchanan. And Jo said, when you have something like this, you throw everything at it. She was always uh, saying, yeah, look, let's do mainstream, but let's throw everything else we can at this. And I reckon that's not a bad way to approach any kind of thing. You hit it with everything, especially when it uh, could be something life-threatening like cancer. Absolutely. You know, my mom, um, my mom, people were praying for my mom in a variety of different um, houses of worship. I won't say churches because they were churches, temples, and mosques. And sure. You know, I thought to myself, what is it about the human spirit, the human energy, that when we come together becomes more powerful? Well, it's any kind of group energy is um, so much more powerful than the individual. And uh, we've talked about this before in my books, Afterlife and No Goodbyes, where I explore the whole realm of the uh, world of spirit. Uh, I contact over there. Uh, with a group of spirits who come together to work with me here, uh, which I'm very honored to be part of that group. And that great group energy is so strong. There's about 95 to 100 different spirits working and communicating from all levels of the afterlife because they want that information to get through to us here. That's what I've written about in my books. And I figure, well, why not do the same thing? I mean, we are, after all, spiritual energies occupying a human body or attached to a human body, so we can have that human experience. So it's exactly the same principle, really, as above, so below. Well, and let's, can we deconstruct that for a minute? Because I I hear that phrase a lot, as above, so below. Um, yeah. What does that really mean? Well, 
I guess it's the old concept that uh, heaven is up there and we're down here. Um, and it essentially means that what goes on in the world of spirit is reflected here on earth because we are spiritual energies and we're bringing all of our knowledge, all of our experience and all of the karma, everything we have to work out into this life so we can have this experience and progress as a soul. So whatever does happen in uh, this realm is a reflection really of what goes on in the world of spirit. And that's why so many people sort of uh, get a surprise when they find out getting back to the afterlife, that it's very much the same as here. It's not as if you're going off into some sort of little cloud kingdom where harps are issued and we all float around on clouds. It's essentially a very similar sort of situation in the afterlife. So as above, so below. Ah, I got that. Thank you. Because, you know, there's all sorts of different concepts. And I think for me, one of the easiest things, like my mom, when she was in the dying process... <laughs> Uh, she told me not to worry too much because she said, don't worry, I'm just in the next room. And I really didn't understand, you know, I'm grieving, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm frightened. You know, sure. all these things going through my head when somebody is terminal. Like, how do I live without you? How do I, you know, I talk to my mom every day, Barry, for like 20 years. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was by morning because it was already three hours later there and I would have my cup of tea and we'd have our little chat and then I would go on to work and do my thing and um, you know some of us have those kind of relationships whether it's with a parent or a sibling or a spouse and when that person is leaving their body it's really frightening and upsetting and she would just say don't worry I'm just in the next room I'm going to be in the next room I can help you more from where I'm going I'm just going to be in the next room and I really didn't, I couldn't, my brain couldn't take that in at the time. And really for the months after, I really was in a state of confusion and shock. And then it started to hit me later on after, you know, a year had gone by and two years and three years. And now we're in year four that she indeed is just in the next room. Well, that's exactly it. Um, this whole whole concept of heaven is up there and hell is down there and we're somewhere in the middle. Well, for a start, there's no place like hell. There are just various levels of the afterlife. But the afterlife is not sort of up there floating around like some kingdom in the sky that we can't see. It's actually another dimension from what uh, I've been had explained to me. And that dimension is uh, a much higher vibratory dimension than ours that's why we can't actually see it but it's in the same sort of area that we are we're all occupying the same kind of space now this sounds a bit weird and a bit difficult to comprehend maybe at first but when you think about it that's why they are just in the next room because it literally is that we just can't see them we can feel them we can communicate with them they can see us but they have to lower their vibrations to be able to come back to see us. That's why we often see them as sort of shimmering outlines and things like that. But yeah, they are just in the next room. Well, and my mom's really loud. You know, it's funny because she was a very kind of quiet person, but if you got her riled, you know, she would really speak up. And, you know, there are times when I used to think my brain was playing tricks on me or I was just grieving or I just wanted it so bad. But um, I'm going to tell you a funny story about um, my mom and my dad. They were married 60 years. And my dad came to live with me after my mom passed. And I'm single and I have two kids that I, I'm raising and I'm soul supporting. So I, I'm real busy. And my dad came in one day with the little pipe from the fireplace, the little gas pipe. And he said, oh, you know, I was cleaning this and, um, you know, uh, I noticed it was broken. And I would have thought my mom was sitting in the chair next to me. And she's like, oh, that's not true. Your father broke it. He just shoved the, the shovel in there, cleaning up the ashes and broke it off. So before <laughs> I could even think, I said to my dad, I go, no, mom said you broke it. You shoved the thing in there and broke it when you were pulling the ashes out. And he looked at me like white faced, you know, <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, those things don't happen all the time, but they happen frequently enough that I'm comforted to know that that her spirit or her soul or whatever you want to call it is still with me 
every day because I was in such a state that day, Barry. I was doing, you know, 20 things at once and there was no way I could have conjured this up myself. And it was so loud. It was so loud. It came in the ear, came right right out the mouth, Um, you know, and it's just and that's where I think it's fun. Well, that's the wonderful thing, Sandra. I mean, they're not around us 24-7, obviously, because they've got things to do and we've got things to do. But they know, they understand when we are in distress, when we need to communicate, and they can pop in and pop out. They can travel that vast distance between the, the, the earth plane and the world of spirit in the blink of an eye. And... They can be with us and they can sense us, but they're not sort of hanging around. So don't think that you know, your, your mum's watching you at <laughs> all, all hours of the day and night. Because some people might think, oh, hang on, I don't want my parents around at certain times of the day. Uh, no, they're not. They come and they go. and uh, the, But they always are where we really need them most. And, and that's the most important thing. Well, and did you find when you're, you know, because you went through, you you had a, a long time relationship that that she crossed over. Did you find that she would pop in at regular intervals? Oh, yeah. Look, actually, Judy and I were only together in this life for about four years. It seemed a lot longer because we were with each other all the time. So it was about what most people would spend about 10 years together. But we've had many lives together. And uh, Judy was the one that came with me. Uh, in spirit, many occasions, if I was running a group, for instance, I used to call her my little spirit wrangler because she would bring people in from the other side. And uh, there's usually what they call a gatekeeper when there's a, a medium involved. And a medium has this gatekeeper who brings people through. And um, the gatekeeper, in this case, uh, was, was Judy. And she used to <laughs> wrangle all these spirits for me. And, and sitting in the group and in various other times, they would be there. But that continued, and, and she inspired me to write my, my two books, Afterlife and No Goodbyes. But she's now moved on to a much higher dimension, so we don't have as much contact. But, you know, we're both doing our own thing, and we are in contact when we need to be. Wonderful. We're visiting today with Barry Eaton. He's the author of The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife. He's got other books that we're going to talk about in the space of this uh, show today. But for now, we'll be back after the break with more from Barry Eaton. We've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. Have you heard? The pages of American Patchwork and Quilting magazine come to life on our new weekly online radio show, American Patchwork and Quilting. Join Pat Sloan, our blogging and quilt designer host, as she talks about the latest trends, ideas, and inspirations. Her guests include quilt pattern designers, authors, quilt shop owners, and our editors. All quilters, just like you. Call in with your questions. Get quilting tips from industry experts. Learn about free patterns. Hear behind-the-scenes stories from our magazines, American Patchwork and Quilting, Quilt Sampler, and Quilts and More. Get the scoop on free stuff and find out more about the best independent quilt shops in North America. To listen to a live show, tune in Monday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Just log on to allpeoplequilt.com slash radio. To hear past shows, go to iTunes and search for American Patchwork and Quilting Radio. We hope you'll join us because we know that quilting changes everything. Did you know one-third of the population suffers from bad breath? Several years ago, a New York City doorman was actually suspended from work because people were complaining about his bad breath. Other words for foul-smelling breath are halitosis and ozostomia. So, what are common causes of ozostomia? Coffee is a problem because it's very acidic, and bacteria reproduce faster in an acid environment. Candy and gum contain sugar, which is also a problem because sugar feeds the bacteria that cause bad breath. Alcohol is another culprit. What's another name for cheap wine? Plonk, slip slop, or stinky bus. It's marching neighborhood. 
I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and I'm visiting with Barry Eaton, the author of The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife. Um, You know, Barry, when you were diagnosed with cancer, I'm sure you had every fear, like every other cancer patient in history, but... Was there a part of you that was more at peace, do you think, because of the research and the work you've done exploring the afterlife? Like, I'm curious how that played a role with you. It's not like you had cancer 20 years ago and we could compare and contrast. But do you think that your understanding of the afterlife helped you with your with your treatment, with your diagnosis, with, with kind of that whole process? Well, Not only the afterlife, but the contact with the world of spirit, Sandra. I never at any stage felt that I was going to lose my life over this. But then there was always that underlying thing that, well, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm certainly not worried because I know that returning home to the afterlife, because that's where our real home is, everything was going to be great. So I thought, okay, if it's my time, I'll go back over there and uh, do what I have to do. But I never really believed deep in my heart and in my own intuition that I was going to lose this battle, especially then when I went into a series of deep meditations and connected with my spirit guides and was told exactly the sort of treatments they wanted me to uh, to undertake. And they wanted me to do that because they want me to write a book about it all. So that also sort of buoyed up my spirits because I thought, well, they're not going to say, well, go and write a book and then uh, take me off in the middle of all that. So I I figured that, yep, I was in here for at least a mid-haul. Maybe not the long haul, maybe not the short haul, but somewhere in the middle. Okay. Okay. So when when did you get the idea to write the book did it start did it come to you right quickly when you were diagnosed like this is this is this experience i'm going to have so i can write about it or did you have like a waiting period where it came to you you know during the process like when when did that that calling happen well that was when i was in meditation and it wasn't my idea i didn't go into this whole thing thinking oh great i can write a book about this because I, at that particular time I was putting the finishing touches to no goodbyes. This was back in 2013. And um, I was we, we delayed the publication of no goodbyes because of my cancer. And uh, I never ever thought about writing a book on that because I thought, well, I'll be writing my third book in the trilogy series of The Afterlife. So the, the idea of writing a book about the cancer experiences uh, was really given to me by my spirit guides. And I didn't even think about it until afterwards But my partner, Anne, who co-wrote the book with me, suggested from the very beginning, from the get-go, that we would keep an audio diary. She said, you're a broadcaster, so keep keep an audio diary. It makes sense. So, which I did. I kept a weekly diary and summarized everything. And it was great because when it came time then, when we did decide to go ahead with my spiritual urging to write the book, that we decided to write it together, but I had all those wonderful notes. So I I guess it was part of the purpose of me actually getting this cancer, Sandra, that um, I believe that everything happens for a reason. And really, this was part of the journey that I'd signed on for in this lifetime as Barry Eaton. And the book was something that, while I didn't think about it while I was going through, it then became a natural process, the evolution of everything that happened. So, okay, for other people that might be listening to this and having an experience, whether it's with an illness, it could be with a relationship, it could be with a trauma, with a whatever. Sure. Tell me what it looked like. Were you like Captain Kirk, you know, like Stardate Log, you know, 2017, (laughs) you know, the chemotherapy, this is what I feel today. Like, what what did that look like? Because I'm curious, you know, I think it's intriguing. (laughs) And I have a picture of you in like your Spock uniform or your Captain Kirk uniform doing your Stardate Log. Oh, look, you must know that I'm a star. (laughs) 
Star Gate fan and a Star Trek fan and old Trekkie from way back. <laughs> but no, I, I didn't. I got that. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do the logs like Captain Kirk. Uh, no, it was just me speaking into uh, my portable uh, recorder and uh, putting down my thoughts and and putting down some of her thoughts as well, the emotions, the events, everything like that, which was very very good afterwards. But um, no, it, it was an invaluable thing. But I, I didn't actually go about it like the Stargate or Star Trek. <laughs> it's an interesting, uh, interesting visualization, though, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, you know, because it's like if I were to sit down and go, I'm very comfortable if I had to sit down and keep a journal. But I don't know, like, how do you do an audio journal? You just talk. It's like we are now. I mean, I, I've been a talker, a broadcaster, a professional communicator for over 50 years. So it's an, easy for me to just switch on a microphone and just talk. Um, I do readings for people. I do consultations. And, and I talk and I, I give talks, I give lectures and whatever. And when I'm the best ones I ever give now are when I just give over and let spirit talk through me, especially when I'm talking about the afterlife. And I'll come out with things that I think, where on earth did that come from? But I know that I'm being guided from the other side. And I think that this probably happened. I've never talked about this. Interesting, you should mention this. That I, I think I was guided in the information that ended up in the diary because spirit wanted me to write this book. So obviously there was some kind of input that they wanted to have as well. And this happened also as I was writing because in whenever I'm writing, it's not like necessarily automatic writing, but sometimes I'll be writing away there and I'll look back on a paragraph and I'll think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder where that came from. But when I check it all out and do everything, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say and what I wanted to get across. So I think that a lot of good writers who do write with spirit um, – are able to open themselves up like this and, and just do that connection and trust. And that's the big thing with the trust. Well, that's one of the things I've been playing with. And, you know, this is where I, I, I always get excited to talk to you, Barry, because, you know, it's, it's fun. And it's, you know, when you're a professional communicator, you know, and I love how you put that. Like my dad always says, I'm just happy one of my girls got paid to talk for a living. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I found, I've been doing these morning pages, you know, where when I get up in the morning before I, you know, get shot out of a cannon, like for my kids and my dad and everything else I got to do, um, I find myself getting up very early before like the, the pitter patter of the household wakes up and I sit down and I just like dump what comes out of my head and I really don't censor it. And at first it was really prosaic, dumb stuff. Like I'm worried about this or, you know, yep. this week I'm going to make sure I eat enough protein every day and, and manage my fiber intake. I mean, <laughs> they weren't exactly a bestseller. Um, but then it started to come from a place that wasn't me. And I was getting instruction on what I needed to know and learn. And when I've gone back to look at it, I'm like, I don't think I wrote that. Like, I know it was my hand and my pen and my book. Um, but it's really weird when instruction starts coming through. It was a little off, a little unsettling at first. Now I'm getting better with it. Well, I think also it comes from your own subconscious, your own intuition, your higher self, which I believe is um, that part of us that is still left over in spirit. We don't bring all our energy down from the world of spirit into this lifetime. Uh, there is still a, a proportion of it left in spirit, which we can refer to as the higher self. And once we connect with that, and with our guides, then this information that's there for us all, but it's a matter of learning how to do this and, and giving yourself uh, time and the ability to do this. Now, you give yourself the time to do that early morning dump or whatever to start off with, uh, mind dump, I mean, and then um, get into other information. But other people do it through um, meditation or whatever. You need to still that mind. You need to be able to focus on whatever it is that you need to uh, get information about or from. And once we can do that, who knows? I mean, we, we come up with some amazing things. And you've already found it, I've already found it, and I'm sure a lot of other people have as well. But doing that meditation and giving yourself that quiet time, stilling that monkey chatter in the mind, that's the, that's the hard thing. And you do it before, as you say, 
the, the pitter patter. I can imagine there's more than pitter patter in your house in the morning, Sandra. Oh but yeah, before... I'm a six foot one uh, freshman with a size fourteen foot. It's not really a pitter patter anymore. <laughs> Sounds a bit more chaotic than pitter patter, doesn't it? But anyway, we need to give ourselves that that freedom of of mind and that peace, that inner peace, and that is there for us to be able to access. So if we can all do it, find that quiet space within us. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, and I think that's, you know, one thing like finding that quiet space. I remember uh, I read a book by Janet Rebhan many years ago called Learn to Be Still. And, you know, I'm not still by nature and I have a lot of energy and I have a really hard time sitting still. And when I first got exposed to meditation and finding that stillness within, um, it was an effort. It wasn't something that I could sit down and do right away. And I was fidgety and I sometimes I'd lay down and fall asleep. Sometimes I'd sit down and fall over or my leg would fall asleep or my hand would get numb. And um, I, it was definitely an acquired taste. And it was oh, yeah, it's pretty standard. Yeah, definitely a skill. So when we come back from the break, I know we only got two minutes. Um, I want to talk about like that, like how do we develop that and how did you develop it? Okay. Yeah. So we're visiting today with psychic reporter and author extraordinaire, Barry Eaton, the author of The Joy of Living. You also wrote Afterlife. Did you, you have a third one or is that, uh, did yeah, I Yeah, No it? Goodbyes. And No Afterlife. Goodbyes, that's right. And so No Goodbyes, yeah. Yeah, these are really great books. I think everyone should get a copy of them. You can buy them wherever books are sold. You can find them on Amazon. If you want to learn more about Barry Eaton, you can go to psychicreporter.com. Barry, do you have another any other sites you want to send people to? Uh, psychicreporter.com is not actually me, Sandra. Some somebody oh. did a film about me year, years ago and it's <laughs> it's a, anyway, no, my best one is my radio site, radiooutthere.com and Eat. that uh, is and that's got my biog and, and links across to the joy of living and various other things like that. Just radio out there. Three words, but all joined together. Radio out there dot com. Good, good. I'm glad I care, clarified that um, because, you know, when I Google you, you're all over and you're very prolific. So um, it's great to know to go to radiooutthere.com to find out more about our guest today, Barry Eaton. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about meditation. We're going to talk about how did he get into that space to start bringing through this material because I think it's fascinating. We'll be back after the break with Barry Eaton at radiooutthere.com. We've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. This is for all you girls about 42. Tossing pennies into the fountain of youth. Every- it's merging now. When airplanes first began carrying passengers, everyone was treated to first-class accommodations. Caviar and sandwiches were presented on porcelain plates with beverages served in crystal. Flying was truly a special event as passengers wore suits and evening dresses. What do you call a person who is afraid to fly? An aeroacrophobic. The airlines required stewardesses to be unmarried, and many were nurses as well. To be a pilot was respected and revered. What do you call a person who chooses a career based on the glamorous image it conveys? A MODOC. A typical flight in those days from London to Singapore would cost over $17,000 today and take eight days. What's another word for jet lag? Dysrhythmia. It's marching day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. If you could live your life truly standing in a place of peace, joy, and abundance, wouldn't that make your heart soar? Now you can, with lessons in joyful living, with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi, Mondays at noon central. Kimberly Rinaldi, having created a highly successful coaching practice, now teaches lessons in joyful living. She believes in empowering others and that through it, you have the ability to break through any and all barriers, thus allowing you to reach your greatest potential and joyfully step into your life's purpose. 
What used to take weeks, months, or even years, she can now teach you in a matter of hours with her programs. For more on Kim and her show, go to her website, KimberlyRinaldi.com. That's R-I-N-A-L-D-I.com. Then join us for Lessons in Joyful Living with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. This is for all you girls about. Hey, ladies, this is Sandra Beck, and we're visiting today with Barry Eaton, the author of his new book, The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife. Now, one of the things that you said very early on in today's episode was that meditation um, kind of gave you the instruction on what to do and, and also gave you some information that you included in your book. So I want to know what that looks like because when I first learned to meditate, I had such a hard time. It was like washing cats and herding horses and keeping a tin can away from goats all at once. And I, I just, it took me about a year to finally get it together. And then it was really weird, Barry, because once it switched on, I remember setting my cell phone going, okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do a five minute meditation while I goofed up on my cell phone. And I didn't, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually hit the start button. So the five minute turned into like a 55 minute. And then I finally like pulled myself back and said, okay, well, you know, I need to get dressed. I need to get work and get the kids fed. So I need to come back now. And wow, that seemed like a long five minutes. And to my shock, it was 55. And that was not something I was used to, but once I kind of got it down, um, almost like riding a bike, I could ride all over. Yeah, well, this is it. It's, it's like <laughs> anything when you're learning. It's always the, the tough way. You've got to find the best way. And it doesn't matter whether you're learning meditation or learning to play golf or tennis or whatever. Um, you, you've got to find your own method of doing these things that, that suits you. And I honed my skills over quite some time as well, and I ran meditation groups and whatever. Uh, so I've done guided meditations for, for groups and on CDs and all sorts of things like that. But my own personal meditation, I usually do about 15 minutes every day. Uh, whenever, Sometimes <laughs> I get a bit too carried away and can't do it. But I find that I need this peaceful time to be able to slow the mind down and everything like that. So meditation is is something that is just so important. And when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was automatically thrown into this whole area of the medical system. And the doctor said, okay, right, well, well that, that uh, tumor's got to come out now. And then they found out that I had also cancer in the left side of my thyroid. So, oh, that's got to come out as well. And all of a sudden, you find yourself caught up in this maelstrom of medical information and and uh, and, and the, the activity associated with it. So I thought, hang on, whoa, just a moment. I'm not really into all of this um, pharmaceutical side of medicine and the whole surgery and that. I've got to think about this. And I thought, there's no way that I'm going to have something like chemotherapy. My intuition screamed at me, no way, buddy, you're not going to have med uh, chemotherapy. So I, I went into this whole deep meditation series and connected with my guides and all my contacts on the other side and asked what the best thing to do because at this stage my family thought that oh well Barry's in so much alternative and natural medicine everything like that we'll never never get him into a hospital we'll probably see him disappear off up into the mountains into a cave and eat raw vegetables or something and then we'll go and drag his body down in a few months time and bury him they honestly did think that I would never ever have anything to do with the with mainstream medicine but when I went in and contacted my guides, they gave me some very explicit instructions. And they said, look, we want you to be able to combine holistic, holistic practices, spiritual practices, energy, medicine, all of these things. And this will open up. We'll open doors for you. But we want you to combine it with mainstream medicine. And again, I reiterated the uh, thing about chemotherapy, and they said, okay, no, no, we don't want you to have chemotherapy, but we do want you to have radiotherapy. So I thought about this for a while and, and finally agreed that I would go in and combine holistic practices with 
radiotherapy or radiation, as you say in the States. Now, I'm not knocking chemotherapy per se. This is my findings and everything like that. There's been a lot of information coming out recently about chemo. Um, but it's up to people to make up their own mind what they want to do. I'm not telling people what they have to do. I'm only telling you what happened with me. And when I made that decision to combine holistic practices with radiotherapy, everything started to unfold, Sandra. It was, it was wonderful. Spirit started to organize things for me. Once I accepted and trusted, doors started to open in various places. Uh, holistic areas and also even in the, the uh, medical side of things I found out that I was able to go in and have some very specialized treatment for my throat cancer and uh, you know having cancer of the throat is not something that a broadcaster really wants to look forward to so I haven't gotten through the whole fear aspect of this I then made up my mind I had to do something I had to take some responsibility for all of this and it started off with meditation and I agreed that I had created or co-created this so i had to play my part in the whole treatment and the whole healing area i couldn't just sort of wander in and say all right doctor that's it it's up to you now i'm, I'm abrogating all my responsibility it's up to you um, just do something i'm going to sit over here and feel sorry for myself which i think a lot of people do they retreat into fear mode and then just think oh no, there's nothing i can do and leave it to the doctors well yeah but there's a heck of a lot that you can do for yourself and I've found this, I've proved it. And when doors started to open for me in the holistic area, it's amazing what happened. Everything, practical things, that the healers arrived. I, I ended up being um, given access to a, a wonderful crystal bed from, uh, from John of God's Casa. And all of these incredible stories, I've written them all in the, the, uh, the book, The Joy of Living. And... Everything unfolded because I started to play my part in it and I trusted the advice. But it did come back to this meditation and accessing not only my guides on the other side, but also my own intuition, my inner wisdom, my inner learning, because we've got this. And I went at one stage because I, I had to, when I agreed to radiotherapy, I knew I was going to have to wear this incredible mask which fitted over my face and my shoulders and my and my neck and everything like that. I was bolted into this tray. And this was going to happen for 35 radiation treatments of about 35 minutes each. Is this and, that mold they make of your head? My mom had one of those big molds. Yep, yep. They make yep. a mold, and then they turn this into a mask. It, yep. It's like netting, but you're still it's very solid, and you're it's, still bolted down onto the tray yes. uh, when you go in to have the uh, radiotherapy, radiation. And... I thought, you know, my God, I'm not going to survive this. The claustrophobia for a start and uh, lying on your back for 35 minutes, I was really, really sort of thinking, how am I going to get through all of this? Well, Spirit had arranged an amazing thing. A few months before all of this, this hypnotherapist contacted me out of the blue for my radio program. Her name is Judith Richards. And she said, I've never done anything like this before. I don't know why I'm doing it. But I just feel the, necessar the necessity to, uh, to contact you. And so Judy, Judith came onto my program, and then we started communicating by email and whatever. And when the time came, I rang her and said, what do you think I can do about this? She said, come up and we'll have a hypnotherapy session. And I did. I went and had, it was one of the best things I did. I had this session with Judith because she's a, a hypnotherapist who specializes in areas of trauma. She helps soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq and whatever to get over PTSD and whatever. So I think if she can do that, she can help me get over potential claustrophobia. So I went and had this session, and it was the best thing I could have done. But the interesting thing in all of this, Sandra, is that at the end of the session, she said to me, do you realize that you have programmed into your subconscious the fact that you really deserved this cancer? Not only that, but you deserve to die. And I said, what? She said, yeah, you programmed into your subconscious that you deserve the cancer and that you deserve to die. And I thought, well, my conscious mind doesn't. I don't think I deserve to die. I, I've done some naughty things in my life, but not that bad. I don't deserve to die because of this. But she said, this is a pretty common sort of a thing that a, a lot of people program this and they deserve to die. And I thought afterwards, gee, I wonder how many people go through 
uh, life-threatening situations, and then their subconscious moves in, takes over, and they don't survive it. And I wonder just how often that does happen. There's no way of proving it, of course, but, gee, that subconscious, it's amazing. But once we can get in, getting back to meditation, and do things like, well, hypnotherapy is a, a, a very, very, very deep meditation, because I, I take people back on past life journeys and everything myself. But um, it, it's amazing once we access these inner reaches of ourself and we connect with spirit and we connect with all those things, just where our journey can take us. And my journey was really, really a huge adventure. It was sort of like, for Barry, it was the equivalent of an Indiana Jones adventure, I tell you. Well, and I think that's, you know, it's so great that you are um, sharing this because I think when people see it and hear it, it's easier for them to try it and experience it and validate that experience. So when you were sitting down, oh gosh, we're coming up on commercial break to two minutes. Um, can you talk a little bit? We're going to, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about the, what the meditation experience looks like, but can you for a quick minute, talk about your three books um, so that the listeners know what opportunities are out there for them to read your work? Yeah, sure. Well, the latest book we're talking about now is The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife. And uh, I co-wrote it with my partner, Anne Morgenoff, who was my caregiver. And uh, her story is as fantastic as well, because everybody needs that care. The Joy of Living is the latest one. But my, the, the reason for the Postponing the Afterlife subtitle is the fact that my first book is called Afterlife, My Journeys into the Afterlife and uh, explaining what happens, uncovering the secrets of life after death, it's called. And then the sequel to that is No Goodbyes. And that was the first time I actually connected with you, Sandra, and also with Linda on the program uh, to be able to talk about that book, No Goodbyes. But that was sort of part two of the afterlife. So I've written three books in all, uh, Afterlife, and then No Goodbyes, and now The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife, which I co-wrote with my partner and more John off. They're all available online uh, through uh, Amazon, through Barnes and Noble, through Book Depository, whatever. I was actually Googling goodreads.com yesterday for, for something else and up came my book there, so, or all the books. Except I must say, somebody's put up there that I write a book called Dominance in Dogs. I don't write that at all. It's some other Barry Eaton, so please don't think that I write about dogs. I love dogs, but I don't write about them. I just write Afterlife, No Goodbyes, and The Joy of Living. So I hope uh, I can help you with any of those books. And right. if you want to find out more, my uh, my email, my um, website is radiooutthere.com. We've got lots more powered up with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin after these messages. If you could live your life truly standing in a place of peace, joy, and abundance, wouldn't that make your heart soar? Now you can. With lessons in joyful living with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi, Mondays at noon central. Kimberly Rinaldi, having created a highly successful coaching practice, now teaches lessons in joyful living. She believes in empowering others and that through it, you have the ability to break through any and all barriers, thus allowing you to reach your greatest potential and joyfully step into your life's purpose. What used to take weeks, months, or even years, she can now teach you in a matter of hours with her programs. For more on Kim and her show, go to her website, KimberlyRinaldi.com. That's R-I-N-A-L-D-I.com. Then join us for Lessons in Joyful Living with your host, Kimberly Rinaldi. It's merging down the herd. By the time this show is over, you'll blink at least 30 times. The average person normally blinks about 20 times per minute or 17,000 times a day. A faster rate usually indicates anxiety or emotional stress. What's the word for someone who blinks a lot? A squint of FIGO. FBI agents have identified a specific type of blink that they directly associate with gamma staying. That's a person who tends toward deception and fraud. 
Attorneys, also known as pedophoggers, look for blinking when they have people on the stand. The eyelash flutter means they really do not like the question at all. Women blink more than men, but when a man blinks at a woman, he always appreciates a wink back. What's another word for flirty? Hazoku. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Word. We're back with Sandra Beck and Linda Franklin. Here's more Powered Up with Beck and Franklin. This is Sandra Beck, and I'm here with Barry Eaton, author of The Joy of Living, Postponing the Afterlife, which is his latest book. And we're going to talk about this last segment, Barry. You know, meditation, we hear that word thrown out a lot. There's people who sell meditation courses, meditation CDs, meditation this, blah, 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 blah. I think we can both agree that it's necessary. It, it For me, I call it my daily meds. I have to take my meds, and it's really funny because I'm not a medicine person. But if I don't start out my day with either like a 5, 10-minute just peaceful moment of quiet meditation or – uh, sometimes I go to bed and I listen to a guided meditation, especially if I can't get my brain to stop. You know, it's kind of like the hamster wheel up there with a whole family of hamsters. So I use different quote unquote meditation techniques, guided meditation and then traditional meditation. And I really don't bend myself into a pretzel at all. I actually sit in this nice comfy chair and that to me works for me, but I think everybody's got to find their own way. And I'm interested in what is your way, what works for you. Because I also think success leaves clues. And if we model after successful meditators, we can kind of get to where we need to go in a more peaceful manner. Yeah, look, you're spot on there, Sandra, because everybody's got to come up with their own technique because we're all unique individuals. Now, meditation, I think a lot of people think, oh, God, you've got to sit in a corner with your legs crossed, your hands in a strange position and go, oh, well, yeah, you can do that if you like. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's certainly not what I do. I've learned over the time that basically it's, as you said, it's getting into a quiet place within yourself because of all this incredible stress that we have around us during life, whether we're herding cats or whether we're uh, looking after kids or whether we're just trying to pay the mortgage and and rush from one appointment to another. And life gets so stressful, particularly, you know, in in 2017, it's it's not easy to, to live a nice, quiet, peaceful life. So we have to be able to take time out time out of our schedule for us it's it's a me time meditation is me time and it's giving yourself that gift of quietness of silence of peace so you really need to do to shut yourself away quietly somewhere now you can even do this at work if everybody's out at lunch or whatever you can find a nice quiet spot if you've got your own office fine you can just um, sit in there and, and very quietly take some time out for yourself if it's at home then, yeah, find this quiet place. Make sure the phone's off the hook and and your mobile's not around, your cell phone's not around, um, and you're not going to be disturbed. If you want to play a little bit of soft music, that's great as well. I've narrated um, CDs and I've I've led meditation groups of, of small groups right through to very, very large groups. And the integral thing is finding that peace within yourself and that is what it's all about. It's the only way to communicate not only with yourself, your own inner voice, but also with your guides and everything like this. It's not some kind of weird religious practice that um, some kind of Indian guru uh, has come up with. No, it's basically the peaceful time within you. And you can achieve this in many ways. Find a quiet spot, Find yourself a comfortable place. Some people like to lie down. I don't. If I lie down, I go to sleep. So like you, Sandra, I sit up comfortably, um, but I don't sort of slouch back because I will go to sleep. So I sit up in a nice, easy way, close my eyes, and let my mind slow down, slow right down. So I, I focus on the breathing to be able to do that because otherwise your mind is going to say, oh, God, I've got to make that phone call afterwards. Oh, God, I must remember to bring the washing in, whatever. But 
all of those things, you just let them go and you can find a little shelf in your mind and think, okay, I'll come back. To, I'll put that up on the shelf. I'll think of that a little later on while I have to. Now, this is me time. This is quiet time. And I always say that quiet time like this is essential for any kind of communication, inner communication or outer communication with your guides. It's like trying to have an intimate telephone conversation on your cell phone if you're in the middle of the Super Bowl with 125 screaming thousand screaming fans around you. You can't do it. So what happens? You get this phone call. You have to have a quiet, intimate chat with somebody. You're not going to sit there and scream out as one of uh, 125,000 different people around you. No, you're going to go somewhere quiet. So it's exactly the same thing. The fans represent life that we are living, this madness of, of the 21st century living. So we have to separate ourselves, find this quiet time. And it's a gift. It's a gift that we give ourselves. Now, some people like to have the guided meditation. If you're learning, I think it's a great way of doing it. There are some lovely meditations around like that, guided meditations. But then after a while, you can progress beyond that and maybe just have some of the soft music that can play in the background. When I was having my um, radiotherapy treatments, I went in there and took my own meditation music in so that I didn't hear all the clanging and, and whatever of the uh, uh, of the radiotherapy uh, machines. And I also then did visualization, which is another form of meditation. My daughter, who's a psychologist, um, said to me, why don't you do visualization while you are having your treatments? And I thought, oh, well, yeah, how obvious is that? Having taught visualization techniques and whatever. Um, but the stress of my own mind had, had made me even forget the basic things that I know about. So I found that to be able to escape that stress, that I was able to go into a kind of meditation during my radiation treatments. So I would go in there, have this lovely music. I used a, a guy called Asha, A-S-H-A, and uh, his music is fantastic meditation music. He's a, an English musician. And so then I would go in there and I'd visualize myself heading off into, usually I'd go to Paris or somewhere like that, maybe down to Avignon in the south of France. I like escaping into places like that. So that was my kind of meditation that I dealt with during my treatments. And you can escape this. You can, if you're in, in horrendous situations like this, you might be recovering, you might have all sorts of problems. There are various kinds of meditations that you can come up with. And the best ones are the ones that after you practice, you come up with yourself. But meditation is not something that you can learn in five minutes. It's not something that, oh, well, I tried it once. Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't stop my mind. Uh, oh, after five minutes, I gave up. I, I tried it once again. Oh, it didn't work. So that's it. I can't meditate. Well, yeah. Okay. Maybe you fell off the bicycle when you were a kid half a dozen times too, but did that stop you from keep on going? No, it didn't. So the bicycle is an analogy. It could have been, you know, anything, learning tennis or, you know, school or whatever. You, you don't give up. And meditation is something that you realize once you have gotten all the benefits of it, it is absolutely wonderful and it changes your life. So I hope that helps people. Well, I think it does, Barry, you know, and I want to give people an alternative perspective, you know, as a busy mom with my two kids and then my 84 year old dad and three dogs and a company to run. Um, it's hard for me to carve this time out, but you know, Barry, where it comes naturally um, when I sit down and I make my list of things to do that day, like it's really hard yep. for me to put when you have kids who need you, especially little ones, you know, you don't want to forget to pick them up from the dentist or you don't want to pick them up, forget they have X, Y, and Z time, <laughs> um, you know, which can happen. Um, I, yeah, you don't want to leave them at the dentist, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I mean, that has happened. Um, but I sit down with my planner in the early morning, in those morning hours, and I write down all the things that I don't want to forget, everything that's pressing on my brain. And then I put my pen down and I have my little, you know, day planner next to me when I do my morning practice, my meditation and then my morning pages, because 
if something does pop up and it's important enough for me to write it down, it's really not that big a deal to take your pen and write down, you know, don't forget the dentist. And then you have it down there and you can let go of it. Where as a mom, I've had a hard time in my initial practice. They're like, you need to sit quietly. You can't do any of this stuff. Well, no. When you're a working mom, you can take three seconds to write down what's in your head that's pressing so that you can have the relief. It's just like offloading a computer or shutting a program down. And if there's something it has to do before it shuts down, that's okay. And I think that's where, you know, like when you talked about laying down and falling asleep, that's me too. Like I've had to maneuver around this for what works for me and clearing my slate is what I call it. Like I clear my slate in the morning. I write down all the things that I'm thinking about or I'm, I've got to remember and then I don't have to remember it and I can clear that slate. So it's clean for other stuff to come through because if you're trying to remember everybody's soccer schedule and dance schedule and the dentist (laughs) and And, you know, what's for dinner and what do you have to pick up on the way home? It's too much to hold in your head. So writing it down to clear my slate before I meditate, I found is really helpful. I don't think I could do it otherwise. Yeah. If I can offer one small suggestion there, Sandra, instead of saying don't forget to pick up so-and-so from the dentist, use the word remember rather than don't forget. Okay. That, that becomes a negative, and we can program ourselves into the, the negative side of things, and that word don't can quite often be uh, absolutely ignored by the subconscious. So it's better to use the word remember. Remember to pick up from the dentist. Remember to uh, the soccer schedule, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's for – I've, I've learned that over the years, that uh, using the, the positive language helps when we're putting something into our subconscious, which is what we are actually doing. Uh, well, but I, 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 you know, when I'm you sorry. tell me, you know, I was just thinking about that, Barry. It feels better. You know, if I say to my kids in the morning, don't forget this, they roll their eyes. Exactly. But if I say, remember, you have the dentist today, they say, OK, like you're so spot on on that one. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's just a figure of speech part, people might think, but it's not. Uh, and the subconscious doesn't recognize the negative. So it's far better to put any kind of positive approach in there. But look, I, I agree with you to be able to give yourself that, that time. And I write lists all the time. Otherwise, I, I end up forgetting as well. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting life that we're leading. Well, and I think, you know, giving ourselves permission to figure out what works for us and when, because I know most of the time I have a hard time meditating at night. I need to really do it in the morning, almost like my workout. Like by the time eight or nine o'clock rolls around, I'm done. You know, put a fork in me, I'm done. And I there's not much more going on. But other people find it great at night. So I think it's one of those things where you just keep trying to to make it work. Fit, funny, and fantastic in your 40s. Linda Franklin, a New Yorker with a successful marriage and 